Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and um, I've been focused on autoimmunity in COVID-19, and it has caused me to look at the pandemic and the pathology around the pandemic from a slightly different angle. I've recently been involved in a very important conference and congress, and this was looking at post-vax long COVID. And we had just finished two days of this congress, Saturday and Sunday, and I'm highlighting an important piece of that discussion that stood out to me. So there were two speakers uh, that um, I'm relating this to, and you can see in the image here that I've got that you can see that I'm talking about the clots with regards to the embalmers. I've recently covered this, and what the embalmers have been seeing are these very strange fibrous clots that were located in the body, which came out after the body, the blood had been cleared. This is what a normal clot looks like, and this is what they're seeing. It's very unusual, and I've been raising the awareness that the scientific community needs to provide some answers, and where can these answers be related. So just a reminder before we go any further, that I want you to take a look at this conference. It's right here. This is on my Substack now, day two of the full conference here. You have all your time codes. It has all the presentation slides as well for those people who want to know exactly what the presenters had said. So please take a good look at that and you should find very valuable information in relation to that. So a part of the conference was an important conversation from Dr. Robin Rose. I'm going to play that first, and then I'm going to play a short clip from uh, Dr. Beata Jäger, who is in Germany. So Robin is in the U.S. And listen to what Robin says with regards to her concern at the time. What I don't really mean to sound like an alarmist, but I, I will say from a clinical pr perspective, it's extremely alarming to see what we're seeing in just our clinic and patients that don't have long hauler COVID and the biochemical markers, the inflammatory bar markers that are completely abnormal. And I will tell you, we are testing every one of our long hauler COVID patients with the microthrombi testing. And I showed you in the talk that they all have on average like 3.5 out of four to four out of four, right? Grade microthrombi. So I called the clinic, I called Jordan Vaughn's clinic to understand if they had a control group and they do have a control group and the control group even shows two out of four to four out of four. So this is like extremely disturbing and disconcerting and we have a lot of work to do. So what she's talking about is that she's talking about long, long COVID or long hauler disease. These are people who have symptoms. And when they come to the clinic, they do a series of tests on them looking for microclots. So what was concerning her was the amount of patients that seemed to have high levels, 3.5 out of 4. So that's pretty high levels of microclots in their blood. So she then goes back to the clinic um, or the lab that's doing these investigations and says, well, do you have a control group? That means people who don't have any symptoms. And remarkably, they are also having elevated levels of these microclots. Now, that is extremely important and disconcerting because why would they have elevated levels of normal markers even without symptoms? And this is one of the most important aspects around the pandemic. This is why I'm advising people to stay on their guard because this is not over. There still may be underlying disease that is present but silent, kind of like what happens with hypertension. The reason that I made the question with regards to the relationship to the VAX was largely because the control group was elevated. Why would that occur? Now, we don't seem to have a control group that was pre-pandemic, and so it's very difficult to know what exactly that was. Well, when we look at this study, this biochemical journal here, so this is the paper that was published in 2022, looking at the role of amyloid fibrin clots in long COVID. And they were looking at the, the 
patterns that existed in these patients. And they found that there was extensive fibrin amyloid microclots that can persist and entrap other proteins. So this is really, really important. Actually, this paper made reference to some of the questions that I had, and I'm trying to see if I can quickly find it, is that they had an example of what it looks like in a normal patient versus those who were having uh, long COVID. And in this image here, what you can see is this here is normal. So you can see it's very rare that you see anything. These are the long COVID patients. Now, the point that Dr. Uh, Robin Rose was making is that they were seeing these kinds of patterns in patients who didn't have long COVID. So the normal or the control group did not look like this anymore. That is extremely concerning. And it raises the question as to what could be the cause. Again, I highlight why I made the connection so that it's clear. And it's because there was a quote from this patient paper that I thought was extremely valuable. And it's here. And in this point, what it's saying is that the addition, uh, importantly, addition, addition of recombinant SARS-CoV-2 S1 spike protein to normal plasma was sufficient to induce the formation of these clots that adopt amyloid states and are resistant to fibrinolysis. So you have to remember that once spike protein gets into the bloodstream, it seems that it makes these clots. And so this is part of the reason why it's important to not assume that infection is necessarily mild because once spike protein gets into the bloodstream, it increases the risk of clots. And that's why the natural or the mucosal immunity to prevent the virus from getting into the bloodstream is so very critical. And it also highlights the point that if you have circulating spike protein, which is potentially higher to occur with regards to um, some people who have um, uh, circulating spike proteins after vaccination, this could then increase the risk of it occurring. These are very, very important points that we have to try and clarify. Listen to Dr. Beate Jaeger. Now, she is doing help apheresis where they are technically passing the blood through a machine to take out abnormal proteins. And here is what she was observing when she was happening to do this. This is Dr. Beate Jaeger in Germany. Did a presentation on the fact that the embalmers were seeing some extremely unusual fibrous clots that it seems that the scientific community has largely ignored. Based on your apheresis, because you are filtering the blood, is there anything that you have seen there that would support what they have been noticing? Yes, a uh, very important question, Philip. I exactly observed the same. One of the very, some of the very first uh, patient was a physiotherapist lady from Mülheim, Germany. And I, we stuck the needles into her veins properly and we had no blood flow at all. So I put the needle out and I had a 12 centimeter long clot in both of her arms. And I saw this uh, repeated times in several patients and that was the reason that I added aspirin and then clopidogrel and then uh, dabigatran and then instead of dabigatran heparin because there was such a massive overactivation of the clotting system and in parallel a lack in the fibrinolytic ability that uh, that as the big strand I was showing you, uh, which is millimeters long. So how should this pass the microcirculation? It's unbelievable. So this is highlighting in a patient with long COVID. And we have to remember that long COVID affects both people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated. So it's not clear what that person's status was. But the principle remains that the microclotting can lead to quite severe clotting. And maybe these amyloid structures, now for anyone who's seen before, I think that it's also connected to cryoglobulins, abnormal proteins that are in the blood, immunoglobulins, and everything coming together after death 
will produce these very strange looking plots. And so it, it's incumbent on the scientific community to try and find answers. And especially when we're seeing such unusual patterns in patients, it's really important that we try and clarify whether or not this could be relevant even before somebody dies in terms of the kinds of diseases that they get. So very important point. So just finally a reminder, if you want to see the full Congress with the time codes and the presentations, click on the link and I look forward to sharing more information with you, bringing up points from the recent conferences and bringing forward the latest research. Have a great evening.